Well, hello, Robin. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast for the Virtual Art Summit. How are you doing today? I am great. And thank you for having me, Kelly. It's fun to be here. Well, I was just saying how much I've admired your work for so long. I feel like there's so much to learn from you. So it's a real honor to have you in the Virtual Art Summit. And I'm really excited about it. Thank you. It, it makes me happy to hear that. Thank you. Yes, I happy know that everybody who's participating is just going to, you know, have their whole mind expanded from what you have to offer. So I, I just want to get to know you a little bit, like where you're from, what you do, what your story is, and how you ended up as an artist. Okay, well, I'm getting a little older, so the story's getting longer and longer. So I'm going to try to keep it. I'm going to try to keep it condensed. But uh, now I'm in Portland, Oregon. I grew up in in the Bay Area in California and spent um, much of my life there, and have been in Portland for about the last 20 years. Love the Pacific Northwest. Love gray skies and rain and all of that. It's totally my environment. So that's I love where it I am too. Now. Just so you know, I love it too. Okay. I'm a little jealous of you. It's rare to find the people who do. So that's <laughs> nice to hear. So I just probably most artists, I was one of those art kids. I loved just making things, you know, if it was a box and fabric scraps or I, I did a lot of drawing, but it was mainly more, you know, crafts and sewing and anything like that I was always doing and loved it. And so uh, when it came time to go to college, I saw a commercial art program. And one of my big goals was to support myself. And so I saw that I thought, oh, that's perfect. It's um it's art and there's jobs connected to it. And it was called commercial art then. It's, it's probably a cross between an illustration and a graphic design program now. So I, I went to that and got a really nice foundation. And we, it, was, um, it was a technical school that we went to five days a week, six hours a day. And the first term was all drawing. The second term was black and white design. The third term was color design, color theory and design. And I just loved those. It was just total immersion in those things. So that's my background comes from that. But as soon as it started switching over into the commercial side, I was like, done. I had no interest in typography. It was all done by hand back then. It was very tedious. It was like logo design. All No, no, no. So anyway, I, I left that. I ended up going to regular college and I... I'm going to make a big leap just to keep things faster, but I ended up getting a PhD in English and teaching at UC Davis. I taught um, writing classes and literature. And so I kind of left art behind for all that, but it kept nagging me in the background. I, I was always drawn to it. And just for my own sanity, I started taking quilting classes while I was in the PhD program. And I just fell back in love with color and pattern and design and I just played with it. I never got great. I never became a great art quilter or anything, but I just played with that for quite a few years. So I have a lot of background in textile arts. And, and then as time moved forward, I was home with my young kids and I had this urge to paint, which I had, I had never really done, like with a blank canvas. And I found this book, gosh, I hope I get the title right, Life, Paint, Passion, I think it was called by Michelle Cassou. And it was all about intuitive painting. And so I just did that for like a year of just putting cheap kid paper up on the wall, cheap kid paints and painting every day just because I love doing it. And then it hit a point where I thought, you know, these just aren't really getting much better. I'm just kind of, I'm having fun, but it's nothing I really want to hang on my wall or anything. So then I, I transitioned over and started taking more painting classes and, you know, doing the whole traditional still life and painting cardboard boxes and, you know, all of that. So, um, and another big leap forward, I did all kinds of mixed media art during the during that time. And finally, it's probably been about 10 years ago, I started finding a way in abstract art that I could bring together that love of intuitive painting, wild, let loose, be free, but all that design element that was still in my background. And it was the first time, as soon as I started doing that, it was just one of those light bulb things. So for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years maybe now, that's pretty much been my focus is abstract art. And that means mixed media, acrylic painting and mixed media thrown in. Yeah. So I mean, that's, that's a lot of years all thrown like, together there. So tell me, <clears throat> well, I love that you had that foundational time in college where you were learning the, the good stuff, the fun stuff, and that you, yeah. were, that you were able to honor your spirit and not go down the route of tedious commercial work if that's not what you were interested in, although I find English to be a rather creative field anyway. So <laughs> that must have been pretty fascinating nonetheless. But I hear that story often with women with their kids or young, and it's like, I just need an outlet. I'm desperate to have that outlet. And I love that you might, 
I, I can see the strongest work from artists is when I hear that they gave themselves time to play and explore. And the fact that you just spent that year making a mess without having to think of it as any finished product is just brilliant. In all honesty, I mean, like that opens you up to being a better artist in all honesty. So and I totally agree with that. I think it was such an important foundation for me, almost as important as all that design work was right. to have that freedom. And it's still every day I'm, I'm pulling back on that. You can still give yourself that permission to just, you know, the, the process, the exploration, the, the play, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when did you start turning it into, are you a full-time, I should ask you, are you a full-time artist now? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I'm retired, so I'm not doing this for an income. I'm not full-time professional okay. that way. So I'm a full-time love it artist. So I, I feel like I'm down in my studio several hours a day. That's definitely not full-time by any means. But art is just, I'm constantly reading art books, listening to podcasts. Blah, blah, you know, so it's kind of full-time art. In all yeah, no, no, ways. I consider that full-time for sure. <laughs> you don't have another career that you have to bring in. No. It. You get to spend your time. I mean, like most people aren't going to, even if you're a full-time artist, aren't going to spend eight hours a day painting. If you are, you're lucky. That means you have a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that you get to paint regularly, that you get to absorb yourself in art and just show up fully is that so real. I think that's, I, I hear that often, how much people just look forward to that time where they can really be in it all the time, making it part of their daily life. And I, I it's wonderful that you do. What? Yeah. So then what does your art life look like now? Are you teaching classes? Do you um, go take workshops? What do you like to do other than, I mean, do you, ha do you sell your work in, the gal in galleries or something or online? Well, for selling, which is a very minor, minor part of my art, I, I do have a gallery up in Bainbridge Island, very nice gallery that's right outside of Seattle. Um, so I have that gallery and I just had a, a show, a two month show um, that ended in January and I do sell through Instagram. So I do sell some, but I have to say that is so, so minor. And even mm -hmm. though, uh, you know, I, I don't even know how to say this, but I would just say, keep a day job is all I would say. Is I, If I had to make a living off of this, I would drive myself crazy because I think unless you get into teaching or some other avenue, it's very, very hard, even with a gallery, even with Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know, I have sales. I'm really thrilled every time I have one, but it's certainly not enough to live on. So, um, yeah, that's the that's the sales side of things for me. I taught for years and I the last time I taught, I was teaching at a homeschool resource center. And I taught everything from kindergartners to I designed a whole course in art and design for high schoolers. That was a three year program. And I adored doing that. It was so much fun. I loved working with teens, especially. It was really fun. Yeah. But I stopped maybe about five, seven years ago, because when I'm teaching, all of my energy goes into teaching and it doesn't go into my art. That's like way down the line. So I just decided I'm, I'm stopping that. So now I'm not teaching. Um, at all. I'm just going to say at all. I'm not teaching now. Um, Except so, for our pleasure in having you at the virtual art stuff. So <laughs> and that, that was exciting to me because I thought I don't really want to do my own online class. I, you know, I just don't want to do it. But I thought it was fun to get a chance to step back into yeah. teaching. I really enjoyed that. So it was good for me to have that that little avenue to get back in. But no, I really want to focus. I'm at a stage in my life. I want to focus on doing my own art when I want to do it. So that's kind of where all my, my energy goes. Um, I was taking a number of workshops before COVID and now I've switched mm -hmm. to online workshops and I now am very spoiled by online workshops. It's like, oh, I don't really want to schlep my stuff across the country. So I do still take some online workshops, enjoy that. And, you know, it's just any place I can find art through memberships, through I've got several online art groups that I'm involved with. I feel like my life is pretty much immersed in art in lots of different ways like that. Having community makes a huge difference. And even for many of us long before we had a pandemic shut us all down from being able to do things outside of our home, we were taking advantage of this beautiful online community that's just connected throughout the whole world. I like I wouldn't be able to have done what I was doing without it. And I know that I found most of the people that I've are in my circle through Instagram, which is really great. And I don't know, it just traditionally painting is a very solitary endeavor. 
And so having like that outlet to just, you know, I love to just sit and just talk art, you know, talk about the last art I saw in person or the, a new painting process or whatever, and just see what other people are doing. And so I feel so grateful to the online community and, and it makes a difference because we're not doing it alone anymore. I know. I love that too. It's really been great. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about your process. I know it's harder to talk about than to actually see, but sometimes that just that process of how it all comes out. Um, I love to hear like some of the things that inspire you, tools you love to use, ways in which you like to make your work. <laughs> yeah, and I I do jump around with different media a lot, so so t there's not like one set way, but. Um, well, I'll state like with my acrylic um, abstract paintings, I always start with playing and whatever size I'm working on, um, you know, a big canvas or a small piece of paper, it always starts with play. And that usually means mark making to me. I often incorporate writing in those first uh, first things because I'm a big journaler. I do morning pages. I've been doing morning pages for like 25 years now. I just love to get my thoughts out that way. So that first layer is always about play. And then so are probably the next six layers. I just keep playing. I mix different media. The paint comes in. And then there comes a point where it um, it's just, just that big wild mess. And that's when I can step back and that design mind comes in to start saying, I need some composition. I need to think about how the eye moves. I need some breathing space. So I will be in that mode for a while, more analytical. And then, um, but I almost always, yeah, I, I never end in that analytical mode. I always want to flip back to the play again, where the markers come out and there's some big final marks on it that it just feels like that's where it needs to end with that playful spirit coming through. I don't want it to end up too tight, too controlled, too like, oh, she thought about where to put this and that and that, you know, I don't want that to come through. I want my paintings to look free, easy. I want them to look like they just fell out of me, even though they often take months to do, you know, it just, I want them to feel effortless. Yeah. So play is huge in that, all of that. That's really important. Do you have an idea of at least like maybe what colors, what direction you're going to go when you start with your play, when you start with each piece, or they, does that just happen intuitively as it, as it evolves? Um, kind of all of the above. Uh, sometimes I do like to have a limited palette. I do really like a limited palette. So I often will think of that along the way, but I find it's more exciting and those very initial um, stages to usually just let go with anything because it's that little tiny spark of rust color through the blue and green painting that just brings it alive. And so even though I think you can probably see one behind me that's all ocean tones, um, there are flecks that come through from a little bit of mustard over here that I first, you know, and that's what yeah. I like. I think that just gives a little spark to things. So yeah. I go back and forth with that. Um, rarely do I have a anything goes color wise painting all the way through. I almost always need to, uh, well, I, I really like to bring gray colors in to tone it down more. So uh, my colors usually are pretty focused, I think. That's really great then that you can leave yourself to play and explore and then you still you know, have some sort of focus in it just enough to make it, you know, I don't want to say make sense, but art doesn't have to make sense. I guess it just has to feel like it's all coming together, you know, so that it's yeah. the point of view. But it's good when you think of that last mark. It's just, it's got to be still some sort of wild abandon because mm -hmm. it's easy to make our work too precious when we overthink it and overwork it. So I, I like that disruption. Sometimes when I get too tight or precious, I'm like, I just have to scribble on it and like make yep. some so that I can disrupt whatever that energy is and get it all playful and fun again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a hard line to hit because I do want a sense, you know, that there's a feeling in my work of ways you can move and ways you can relax and ways you can be energized. And it's really hard to find the line of not over controlling that and, you know, keeping it alive with energy. It's, it's a hard yeah. line there. It is. Um, and, but that's where, you know, you have many years of play and experience to know that you can do that. Right. Whereas a newer artist, especially a lot of people who are participating in the virtual art summit may assume that there's like a start to finish process and a logical order for creating a painting when the truth is there doesn't have to be any logic to it. Those foundational principles will make it stand out, but it's all in that, you know, tapping into yourself and, and how you want to express yourself that would make a painting interesting in the first place. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, so true. And I and I like what you're saying that um, there is not a set way. I, I could remember being in that mode, like, you know, tell me what I need to do next step. And it's like, <gasps> no, there's no answers to that. And the answer and is also, play. <laughs> yeah, the answer is play. Keep at it and play. That is so true. And uh, when, I, when I was uh, getting interested in abstract art, one of the first um, artists that really popped for me is de Kooning. And I, I just thought, oh, my God, that's how I want to paint just these free, big brush strokes and going mm -hmm. wild. And I thought, oh, that's exactly how I want to paint. And I read his autobiography and or his biography. And one of the most significant things in my whole art career, I think, was hearing him say that woman one, which is just the loosest, freest painting I can imagine, took him three years to paint. And I was stunned because I really thought you, as an artist, you must just go up and those free kind of things, you just must put paint up and, you know, maybe it takes a couple days, but you know, that would be it. I just thought it fell out of you that way. And it's like, well, that was, it was such a valuable lesson for me because, you know, some of my paintings six months later, they're still like, oh, still not thrilled with it. And, you know, I think, I think that's important to know that it doesn't just fall off your brush. And even, it, even when you're playing, it's like, that's super important. But that doesn't mean you're going to totally love what falls off. You know, you, right. it's a back and forth process for me. I find that quite often, like, you know, I might, for every one successful painting, I might have three or four completely, like, guess it's time to paint over again. But those oh, yeah. paintings that take three years also lead to the next painting taking two days. Like, yeah. sometimes that's what happens is that, like, you, it's a struggle through certain works and then, like, something magical just like all that learning comes out of you in the next piece and it's not so hard. But as soon as you think it's going to get easier, then it gets hard <laughs> again. And as long as you like are rolling with it and not putting pressure on yourself, it's no big deal. You know, but if you, if you bring yourself back into the process instead of stressing, did I make a finished product? Then it's, that's the whole point of doing it. Right. 100%. You said it. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that's why we undervalue sometimes artists who can paint paintings quickly, those who have, you know, made it all click. And that's so great. And I've even gone through this guilt before. I don't know if you've ever felt it like that one painting that just took you one hour and you're like, how? How did that one painting just take one hour? Can I charge as much for that? Can Is it as valuable as the ones that took me three months? It's, I think Picasso said it when a woman came up and said, you know, will you do a little sketch on a, on a napkin? And he goes, yes, here, it'll be $20,000 or something like that. And she's like, but that only took you five minutes. He goes, five minutes in my whole lifetime. Yeah, it's yeah. All the learning that took you to that point to be able to do what you're doing. And so if anything uh, you need is just more hours of play, 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 play. The more I play, the more fun it is and the more I discover what I'm doing. Anyhow, this is a fun because this is like exactly what I get all excited about um, making art mm -hmm. and why we need community to talk because, you know, a lot of times our partners or like, especially my kids, they're like, mom, please stop talking about art. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. That's why we need our art friends for sure. <laughs> so what advice, can, we've been talking about it a lot, but if you can give any other advice, some maybe some exercises or things that you can think of for, for everyone listening that they can use to get motivated to play and not take their work so seriously. Oh boy. Um, well, I actually, on the, the virtual art summit, I kind of go through some of the exercises that I, I like to do just for mark making and loosening up and drawing and writing and different things like that, which I think are just, I, I mean, I come back to them anytime I want to have fun. I'm going to go back to those kind of things. Um, I, one thing that was very useful for me in the beginning was using cheap paper, cheap paint. I, I mean, I painted for a year using the stuff I bought for my toddlers, which was, you know, tempura paint in the cups with the spill proof lids and big fat brushes. And I think there's something, you know, I would say, don't get caught up in the materials thing. You buy those beautiful Golden's paints and every time you squeeze it out, you're seeing $5. You know, it's, you can't do that either. If you have those materials, you've got to let that go or just start with cheap materials and, and play with them and, you know, just get the feel of paint going on a canvas, one layer on top of another and, and not try to make it into something, not, you know, just take the stakes down really low, I guess is what I would say for getting started. Yeah, so it's funny because I used to be on my soapbox, my high horse, if you will, saying, stop using cheap paints. That's the reason it's so hard for you to paint. But 
that barrier to overcome is exactly why you should use cheap paint. And I changed my tune, you know, several years ago. I'm like, whatever you can get your hands on, you know, if all you can do is scribble with crayons, just see how it comes out of you, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And eventually yeah. there's a time for upgrade, but now's not the time. You know what I even do sometimes is paint in magazines. Oh, huh. Yeah. So if I have leftover palette, especially because then the shapes and the colors of the magazine kind of uh, inform what marks I end up wanting to make. I end up throwing it all out. I don't keep it, but it's just for that. Like what would happen if, how would this mark feel? What is this picture that I'd have, you know, I mean, it's a catalog, who cares? It's furniture, but maybe there's texture or something coming out. So that idea of going to like the lowest, cheapest form is actually the totally the freest way to, to create. I love that idea. I've never, that never occurred to me before. I love that idea. Yeah, before um, you throw it out, when you get the next catalog in the mail. Yeah, and, um, yeah that's I, fine. I, I like that. <laughs> I get catalogs for fancy clothes and fancy furniture. I don't buy any of it, but I scribble in the magazine. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, what other thing? I'll just elaborate just a tiny bit because um, I just started um, the 100 Day Project and I've only done it once before. And and my project this year is to stay more raw in my work and not tighten up, not not polish. And one thing I've been doing for the first couple of weeks in it is I've been painting blindfolded and or mark making blindfolded. And I have been having the best time and just putting a big sheet of paper on, closing my eyes, grabbing something and, and making marks and, you know, drawing without seeing what I'm doing. And then the next day I add another layer on top of it, blindfolded again, not knowing what I'm doing. And it's turning into a big old ugly mess. And, but the point is I'm totally free. I'm breaking a lot of the habits that I noticed I have when my eyes are open of like, oh, balance your colors out. And things that I, it, it, it lets me go and just have, get back to the basics. And so that would be another great way to start with um, just, Put a blindfold on. You can't judge anything if you have a blindfold on. So now we're like making a good list here of all the fun little hacks for creating without worrying. You know what yeah. I'm resorting to? Okay, let's just let's keep this idea flowing. <laughs> resorting to so I don't always have energy at the end of the day to come into my studio and paint a lot. So I just put a big bucket of acrylic markers and all of my scraps from my jelly plate print. That, that didn't turn out as something I'd want to use later. I just bring them downstairs and I'll sit and listen to a podcast and use my acrylic markers and just doodle scribbles on top of them. And it's just so therapeutic and freeing because I know I'm not creating anything for any purpose at all. I don't share them on Instagram. I don't do anything with them. Maybe one day I'll collage with them. But right now it's just like, this is play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's so important to find some way of where it is totally play. It's like, I know these layers blindfolded are not turning into anything maybe maybe a bit of collage paper later as i tear it up but it's taking that whole finished product out of it and just really getting back to play i think in whatever form you can do it is so important yep and then that informs later because there will come a time where you want to finish work but all that play is going to make it so much more fun and honestly easier to get to that point yeah yeah definitely yeah. You know how crazy I was when I came back to art? Like I, I did art a lot as a teenager in my early 20s. And then I took a long break, like almost every woman I know. <laughs> the kids are small. And then I came back to it and I started reading books on how to how how to make brush strokes. I was like, like mm -hmm. I look at that, I look at that book now and I'm like, you seriously wanted to read a book about how to make brush strokes <laughs> over actually making brush strokes? What the hell? <laughs> like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> That's that sounds like me. Yeah. How to ride a bike. Let's read a book about it. No, <laughs> just get on the bike. And ride it. Oh, that sounds so much like me. Uh, if I could research it for like six months before I do anything, that's yeah. great. Yeah. So we've got to yeah. just. I wanted yeah, to actually yeah. ask you more about morning pages because it's coming up with mm -hmm. more artists and. I haven't done it, but I know that it would be so helpful. Tell me how you made it your practice and how it informs you now. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, let me just give a bit of background in case anybody doesn't know what they are. It's from Julia Cameron's The Artist Way. And one of her major exercises is you do what's called morning pages. And it's three pages of longhand writing. You can't use the computer in her world. You have to uh, write by hand. And um, it is just 
going writing. Whatever thoughts are in your head go on the page. And so it could be, um, I mean, I often have no thoughts, so I'm just writing over and over. I have nothing to say today, nothing to say today, nothing to say today. Oh, I should take you know, the dog to the park. Let, you know, something will trigger after you do that for a while. So to me, I started when my sons were young and it was just that private space for me to have that time. And you're supposed to do it first thing in the morning. I usually have a cup of coffee first, but it's, you know, you're supposed to just get those first thoughts out on the page. And the whole purpose is just to empty your head of all the bazillion little things we have to do. And often interesting thoughts pop up, you know, ideas do come through in that. And I was just doing it the other day. And it, a lot of mine is, you know, don't forget you want to pick up some asparagus at the store today. You know, they're as mundane as you can imagine. They are so boring. I've lost any interest in knowing my kids or my husband will pick them up and read up because I'm sure they have at some point in my life. And they're so boring, they would never pick them up again, is all I can say. Um, but anyway, they so I, I have started when I do these things and I get a little to do, like pick up asparagus, I just put a little mark in the margin. So it's out of my head. And later, after I've done all my writing, I can come through and see what the to do list is and pull those things out for later. But as I'm writing these boring things, all at once, I'm looking over at one of my paintings that I have, uh, my new paintings I rotate through. And I'm thinking, wow, I love just black and white with a little bit of color. And I think, why am I not doing that more right now? Because that's what I keep coming back to is that's what I really love. And that thought just came. And then it kind of, I kept writing about that and, and thinking of ways like, okay, I've got this big canvas. I need to pull that and start putting some black and white collage on. So it does sometimes tie in with painting. There are many, many days it has nothing in the world to do with painting, but it cleans my brain and gets all that stuff out of there. Some days it's super angry. Somebody made me mad. I'm going to nah, 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 about that. And so it's whatever is in my mind. It just seems to give me a real calm way of starting my day because I've cleaned all that out. Yeah. And I am absolutely addicted to it. I can't, I cannot not do it now. Well, so then what do you do with all of the books filled with your words? Do you keep them all? I have kept them all. And it's funny because I've got, we've got this closet we don't ever use. And so they are stacked up in there for 25 years worth, of tons of them. And I just, we were going to clean that closet. And last summer I told my husband, I said, I think it's time for me to get rid of those things. I said, I guess I'll just burn them. And I picked them up and I don't read them again. They just go in the closet. And I picked them up and I started opening some randomly. And it was like, oh, that's my life of when my children were little and the details and people I had forgotten along the way. And, you know, somebody, woman I met at the park who I was really inspired by. And, you know, just, it was like, oh, wow, my whole life is there. And I told them that, I said, I feel really weird about just like burning my life and my children's, you know, little funny things they said and all, all that stuff. And he said, then don't, just let them stack up. And so my instruction now, I have two sons and I told them then here, when I die, here's your instruction. If you want to read through those, you're welcome to. There's going to be times when you're going to find out I hated you at that moment. Be prepared. <laughs> There's, that's all out there. And I said, uh, I don't want anybody else to ever see them besides you two. And then when you're done, burn them. And so that's, and if you don't want to read them, burn them. So that's, that's how I've kind of come to terms with my whole Did life being written down. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Well, I sometimes say the same thing about my artwork. You know, if it's not if it's not gone out of the house by the time I'm not here, then you know, have a bonfire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not obligated to keep it all. Um, so I love to end my podcast by asking, "What is your big audacious dream?" I feel like it's one of the joys of living is to envision wonderful things that we could imagine for ourselves. Ooh. And I'm kind of curious, like, what is it that you have dream that you're dreaming for in the future? Well, the thing that comes to mind, I have not been traveling since COVID, not much, just little things. And I, and I, it's funny because I hadn't really felt a huge urge to travel either um, after COVID. It's kind of like, okay, I'm settled in. This is good. But just lately, the, the urge has been coming back. And one of my big dreams, um, a friend of mine did this tour of Japan, and it was a total art-focused tour. And it was quite expensive. It was a small group. But they, um, it was completely designed for art lovers. So they went to museums, they went to art studios, they went to, you know, the old craftsman who's been doing the pots for a hundred years, oh, and uh, you know, wow, all through Japan. And it's like it, it was very spindy, but it's like it's kind of, I, I don't know if I could ever do that particular one, but something like that, a very art-centered tour, particularly of Japan. I went there once on a 
kind of whirlwind um, tour of it um, maybe five years ago. And boy, it hit me totally. It's like, I, I need more of that. So I think that would be my big dream right now. I love that dream. In fact, I saw a tour like that once too listed. Out. I can't remember the company that ran it, but like you got to go learn about Shibori dye techniques. That's where they fold the fabric and dye it in blue. Yeah. And then, you know, Japanese painting styles, just like you said, like there was just, and a lot of it was taking you out of Tokyo and into the more rural areas. Mm -hmm. And just like, wow, those ancient traditions that we don't even talk about as much being Westerners, we really focus on Western art history. And yet there's just this richness in Japan that would be amazing. And I would say we would, if we, 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 not you and I together, but we as anybody <laughs> chooses to go to Japan, wouldn't it be lovely to go in the spring when the cherry blossoms are at full bloom? That would be fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I no, love that sounds that perfect. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me on this little fun conversation. Where can everyone find you? First, thank you. It's been, it has been fun. Um, well, I'm on Instagram a lot, Robin Olson Art. Um, and my website is robinolsonart.com. And um, my, I do have, uh, I write a blog there that is quite popular. So it's something you might want to check out. It's all totally art focused, of course. And I send out a newsletter every, oh, every quarter, I'm going to say. I keep meaning to do every couple of months, but you know how it is. So I do do that. And that I always try to include some tips for artists or some recommendations. It's not just like, oh, here's what I'm doing. There's, you know, things of value that people seem to really like. So those are kind of the places I'm at mainly. Fabulous. We will link all of them in the notes and in the course so that people can find you easily. And I hope they do because I love following you and seeing what you're up to. So I appreciate this conversation so much, Robin. Thank you, Kelly. I've really enjoyed it. It's been fun. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.